So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, uh, for coming. For those who I don't know, I'm Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. For our uh, new students, who, uh, this, for whom this is the first semester, welcome. This is our, our monthly public health forum, which is our premier academic forum of um, the academic year. And we do these once every month. And that is the first one of this academic year. This year, every year we have a theme of sorts where we invite people to speak to a broad set of issues. And uh, this year we invited speakers to talk broadly around some of the themes that emerge from our strategic thinking document. For students who have not seen that or for visitors who have not seen that, that is available online. But broadly speaking, it is our engagement in questions around urban living, aging and well-being, health across the life course, and health systems thinking. And of course, speakers take these questions from uh, their own very particular perspective and uh, incorporate, I think, our, our thinking into, uh, into their worldview. And uh, we learn and, uh, I think, emerge smarter from these conversations. So today, we decided to launch this year's uh, uh, Public Health Forum series through inviting certainly one of my heroes in public health. And I, I will tell you very briefly about uh, um, uh, Dr. Josh Sharfstein. As far as I'm concerned, Dr. Sharfstein has had a, a life in public health that is uh, enviable, enviable. That doesn't mean that it's been fun. I'm sure actually he's had a, a lot of bruising along the way. But uh, he really has done everything in uh, public health from the academic world to the public world, although spending most of his time in the public sector. Um, very briefly today, he oversees the Office of Public Health Practice and Training uh, and the General, Prevent General Preventive Medicine Residency at the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's also a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management. But he has previously served as Secretary of the Maryland, De Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, as Principal Deputy Commissioner of the FDA, and as Commissioner of Health for Baltimore City, as well as Health Policy Advisor to uh, Congressman Henry Waxman. And I have uh, had the privilege of intersecting with uh, Josh over the years, and I've always found him to be a thoughtful, clear thinker, and really one of the people who has successfully navigated the intersection of public health practice and the academy, and injecting thoughts into the public debate that I think help us learn and help us think more clearly about what we need to do to improve the health of the public. Um, as um, Dr. Sharfstein will say, he also was a student here and uh, has taken classes with us, so, and he has um, links to many of our professors, which makes it uh, even more special because it's a bit of a homecoming. We are delighted that um, you could join us. Josh. Thank you. It is, it is uh, very much a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Dean Galea for inviting me and for the tremendous leadership he's showing, not only to the school, but really to the whole field of public health. So my topic is upstream, downstream. When I did this, my wife said, nobody's going to get the reference to upstairs, downstairs. <laughs> anyway, did anyone get the reference to upstairs, downstairs? Anyone? Maybe? Bob? No? OK. I'm going to count on Bob. OK. So, um, how public health schools and graduates can succeed in actually improving health. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I trained at Boston Medical Center, got to see some of my uh, uh, colleagues just now um, uh, over at Boston Medical Center. I was a pediatric fellow at Boston University for two years across the street in a building that does not exist and gave me total uh, disorientation when the, I got dropped off here because I didn't see the building that I worked in for two years. Um, I am a proud taker of courses at the Boston University School of Public Health, including uh, health law, epidemiology, and environmental health. Um, uh, I am uh, not a graduate because we had a baby in the middle of the year. And uh, I thought I was going to be able to carry the baby to every class. I see Les Bowden. I brought the baby to the first class with Les Bowden. Such a cute baby, fell asleep, everything worked out great. And then the baby started to grow and whine, and it wasn't going to work out. So um, but I took, uh, it wasn't just that I took the courses here. Um, I am a huge fan of many uh, professors at this school, including Professor Bowden. Adrian Couples, Susan Jick, Leonard Glantz, Wendy Mariner, and George Annis, just to name some of them. I think almost every single course that I took, I followed up with a professor afterwards, and they helped me in the jobs that I had. I, at one point, was the acting commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, and it helped an insane amount that I had taken pharmacoepidemiology here, and that I remembered Susan Jick's name, and that she took my calls, and helped me understand some really complicated things that happened uh, at the FDA. 
Um, I want to just make a, a disclosure uh, that in addition to my work at the school, I do uh, a little uh, consulting for Audacious Inquiry, which is a health IT company in Maryland, and with Sachs Policy Group, which is a healthcare consulting practice based in New York. So um, I'm just going to frame up the question that I'm asking, which is uh, about how public health can make an impact. And we, you may notice these slides have the um, centennial logo from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. This is our centennial year, um, an anniversary that is very understated at the school. Um, not so much. It's on all our slides. Um, so a hundred years ago, it was the first school of public health that was set up, and it was paid for by uh, the Rockefeller uh, Foundation. And there was a committee set up about where to put that first school. And they had to decide between putting it at Columbia and putting it at Harvard. Those were the two choices. They hired the dean of the Johns Hopkins School of uh, Medicine to help advise whether it should go to Harvard or Columbia. And in what might be called the original Dick Cheney move, it <laughs> turned out to be Johns Hopkins. Now, why? Why did it wind up at Johns Hopkins after it was a choice between Harvard and Columbia? And the reason for that is that the logic that the report to the Rockefeller Foundation um, had was that one of the important things about a new school of public health is it really needed to engage medicine. And the only way to be sure that it would engage medicine is if it was affiliated with a medical school and a hospital that employed its physicians so that they could force the doctors to engage. Otherwise, the doctors would never engage. That was the basic logic. And the Rockefeller said, you know, sounds like a reasonable rationale, so is it Harvard or Columbia? And they said, you know, it's funny, only Johns Hopkins employs its physicians. And so wound up, the dean of the School of Medicine, William Welch, went over to the public health school, started it 100 years ago. And in that time, you know, they were there for the great flu, which was a huge problem very soon after. Um, and, you know, you think about the last century, in that century of public health in the United States, um, enormous health gains, almost a doubling of the life expectancy, major gains from clean air and water, control of many infectious diseases. People who were coming from 100 years ago now wouldn't believe that all the things, so many of the things that they worried about really aren't issues, um, uh, particularly in this country. And the reduction of major sources of injury, including uh, motor vehicle accidents, which have declined just you know, tremendously over the last several decades. I got to interview Susan Baker, who's a professor at the school, who did an enormous amount of work um, in, uh, in, in automobiles. In 1968, there were, I think, um, twice as many car accidents as today with a third of the miles uh, driven. And just a tremendous, tremendous amount of progress. At the same time, there is the stalling of progress in many parts of the United States and around the world. There is a rise in non-communicable disease with understanding that there are many contributing factors beyond uh, individual decision making, and a growing appreciation for fundamental issues of equity. So while there's been enormous progress, there is also an understanding that we have a long way to go, that there are massive disparities, there are massive equity issues within our country, within our cities, between our country and other countries, um, and so forth. And you, you know, I have here some uh, illicit drugs, uh, some interesting meal somebody's eating, the international marketing of um, tobacco products, all these things spreading um, uh, disease around the world. This is from a recent JAMA paper just showing the incredible relationship between income and health. Um, just an enormous gap between people who earn a lot and people who don't in their, their life's prospects, I think more than a decade. So, you know, what, I, I'm not going to go into those shifts. You all know those shifts. But I think um, they have important implications for public health. And I read somewhere that public health must engage the social, political, and economic foundations that determine population health in order to be successful in the next century. And both of the authors of that statement are in the room. I think that um, Dean Galea and the school has been incredibly effective as part of the overall movement in public health to say, it, we can't do the same things we did in the last century to be successful in the next century. We've got to engage with some of those upstream factors that really are about society as much as they are about transmission of an infection, say. 
Um, the culture of health is the Robert Wood Johnson's you know, new initiative. They're thinking broader than just individual health you know, initiatives. They're thinking about how do we change people's thinking more broadly and promote health across different sectors. So my question for this lecture is, starts with the assumption that I totally agree. I agree that health challenges of the future are different. I agree with major challenges to face that are different um, and relate to upstream factors. But um, how? What does that mean? We now have agreed we want to take on those challenges. How do we actually do that? And so my background, as you heard from um, Dean Galea, is more on the practical side, being out there in the field. What, what do you do in public health? For the students that are undergrads who are here, which is really cool, you know, you're going to go into public health. How are you going to make a difference? You know, what does it take? What are the opportunities? So I want to talk about four opportunities um, in a little bit of depth for each of them, based a bit on my career and my thinking about health. Four things that I think could really help public health have the kind of impact that it needs to have on these new types of challenges. The first opportunity is to use data differently, and I'll, I'll get into that a bit. The second is to engage with changes that are happening in healthcare, and I'll give a specific example in Maryland. The third is to how to respond to crises and the concept of crisis, which is um, my course that I teach at the School of Public Health. They let me teach any course that I wanted, and so I, they asked me that, and I said, okay, I'll teach politics and public health, because I've been, I've been a political appointee to a mayor, a governor, and a president. So I've done a lot of politics. I'll teach politics and public health. And it turns out at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, they're very flexible about what teachers can teach, except <laughs> if you propose a course that has the same name as an existing course. They don't like that. Okay. So um, someone else teaches politics and public health. So then I was like, okay, I want to teach tough decisions in public health. And they were like, can't do it. Someone else teaches that course. So I went, you know, I did a few of these and I asked my assistant to print out politics, tough decisions, policy, you know, it was like a random order generator, all those courses. There was a huge pile of courses. They're great courses. Then I stopped and I said, what course do I want to take? That's the, what was the course that really would have helped me? And maybe I'll work on it. And it was how to think about crisis and the concept of crisis. And I really do think it's an opportunity. And last, um, the opportunity to actually exert legal power, which is using regulatory authority deliberately and appropriately. That is a very important tool that public health has to make a difference. So um, we'll jump in. Using data differently. So, you know, where this is a little bit of the, you know, part of the, the, the TV special where they show, you know, how the magicians actually do their tricks. Right? I mean, so I've worked in the state health department, the city health department. Um, we have terrible access to data about health problems. I would wake up in the morning responsible for the health of a city or a state and really have very little idea how healthy the city or state was that day. Why is that? Well, most of my data would come from vital statistics. That's the gold standard data. That's a data set that becomes available six to 12 months after the end of the fiscal year, at the end of the calendar year. So if you're looking at infant mortality, they're just about to release the 2015 infant mortality rate. And that's for the whole state, you know? Um, deaths, death data, it, you know, there's a lot of analysis that has to go into it. It's really important data. It needs to be collected, but it's pretty old by the time you get it. Um, if you look at the county health rankings or America's health rankings and you really dig into what measures they're using to judge the health of states and counties, that data is often two to three or more years old. Now, we go over, we were in the hospital today, I saw the beautiful new NICU. Intensive care units have an infectious disease problem if they had a central line infection problem. And I brought everyone together and I said, here's a great idea. We're gonna do an intervention to try to reduce these infections and in three years, I'll tell you whether we're having an impact. You know? And I'm gonna tell you not for your hospital, but for all hospitals in the country. You know, it's, it's not helpful. Right? It's, not, it's not powerful. Um, the data from the major surveys is, is important for academic insights, for understanding problems, but for someone to really know what's going on, not so good. And that, that translates, I'll get to this in a bit, but it translates into less power for public health. Everybody knows there's an addiction uh, crisis and an overdose crisis. Dr. Wally's here who, who works for the state on this. Um, if you go back and look at when CDC was issuing releases about the problem of heroin 
two-year-old data they were releasing. So this crisis is changing very rapidly. Um, you know, there are new drugs that are being used. Fentanyl is a big problem, analogs of fentanyl. Two years is an eternity to be able to really have a good sense of what's going on. But even the federal government has a really hard time getting access to real data that they can um, really dig their teeth into. And it's not just that it's old, but it's infrequent. So, you know, sometimes it's an annual basis. And it's not just that it's old and infrequent, but it's not local. So counties can have millions of people. Zip codes can have more than 100,000 people. And census tracts can have thousands of people. So if I were to tell you, I can tell you the number of falls that happen among older adults in the city of Baltimore two years ago by zip code. That's somewhat interesting, but it's not something that you can really do that much with. So the consequences, I think, number one, if you have less urgency, there's, there's less power. You know, why, if you're saying we have a new case of Zika, you know, on Albany Street, you know, everybody's really excited. That's a, that's a big challenge because it's, it's right there, it's in your backyard, and it's today. Public health doesn't have access to that kind of data. Um, it's, if it's less specific, it gives less power to the argument you're making. Um, I, uh, when I was a city health commissioner in Baltimore, we did the, what I think was one of the first, if not the first, city study of life expectancy by neighborhood. And we found a greater than 20 year disparity in life expectancy. Now before we did that study, I would go with the mayor to um, a uh, open mic night, I don't know what they call mayor's night out they called it. And, we would go to this huge gym or you know, performance space. They would have all these seats, all these people there. They had a big traffic light. So if it was yellow, you had to get ready to stop speaking. And red, you had to stop speaking. And the mayor would sit on this, with this nice little chair in the front. And all the cabinet people would sit in the back. And the first time I went was like my first week on the job. Come on in. And um, the. Uh, I was terrified, right? I mean, I had never run anything. I was now running the health department. I, I, you know, I didn't understand what the health department did. I was going to be in a public forum where any member of the Baltimore community could get up and ask any question on, on any topic. And the mayor might turn around and ask me for my answer. And my, chief, my new chief of staff took me aside and said, don't worry. The only question we ever get is about rats. <laughs> All you have to remember is that there is a guy, I think, you know, say his name was, you know, Mike Smith, and if anyone says they have a rat problem, you go, Mike Smith is here, and he will help you. If you can remember that one line, you're going to be fine. So I sat there, first person, we've got a vacant on our block, what, we can, vacant house on our block, what do we do? We, and they, they turned to the, she turned to the housing commissioner and say, you know, Paul, can you help? And he'd go, I've got someone here who's going to take that down, and we'll, you know, and, and I just sat there, nothing, you know, no, no, nothing for health. I'm just totally petrified. At the very end, someone says they have a rat problem, and I'm like, Mike Smith is here for you, you know, don't worry, we got you covered. And, you know, um, I did a whole bunch of those. And the police commissioner, who was a funny guy, he would text me during the, 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 the actual mayor's night out, Sharfstein pitching another shutout. You know, you know, please 10, health zero, you know. And when I started in the job, I was very relieved. And then I started to think, this is the basis of power. This is the basis of local politics. People respond to what people ask about at these community meetings. It's not good that they're not asking about health. Why is that? Then we put out this report that had life expectancy and a whole bunch of other things by neighborhood. I, we, we went out to every possible neighborhood meeting, and it started to come up. How come we have such a high rate of heart disease? You know, and there was one, one time I even beat the police commissioner. You know, and what I took from that was data is very powerful. If you tell people about the problem, the fact that public health can't do that is a major reason why um, we have challenges. And fixing that problem will be very helpful to the task of addressing some of these upstream issues basically what I was saying, that, that uh, what we want to be able to do is to talk to the nature of problems right now, right here. How do you do that? I think there's a major opportunity in getting real-time data from healthcare. There's been a multi-billion dollar investment in electronic health records. Um, and if you think about the first use of health records as clinical care, so Dr. Vinci can look up the CT scan results of a patient in another hospital, or 
um, you know, you get a, a guideline that says, be careful, there's a problem with the renal dosing of the drug. The second use might be quality improvement. But there's a third use of this data, which is to inform public health. In Maryland, we have a network that aggregates all the hospital data, um, or it makes it accessible, all the ERs, all the hospital data in real time. Um, all the, the diagnoses and um, doc, a lot of the documents, lab tests. And you can do things like map problems on a geographic basis. It's population-based data. Every hospital participates. So you take a problem like um, overdose. You don't have to look at it just through deaths or through the rear view mirror by a couple years. You can say how many people have been in the ER for overdose this week and where did they come from and what's going on. These are just some examples from Maryland system. You can look and say, well, what part of town are the, the visits coming from? And when you look at Maryland, you see that over two years, there was a much greater increase in the west side of Baltimore than the east side. You can look across the state and say, you know, what's going on with dental visits? Where are people going to the ER for dental emergencies? Is there an issue there? You know, dental, de I, I, I remember, in the ER at Boston Medical Center, I didn't even think about this until I just put this slide up, a young woman who had all her teeth knocked out by a baseball bat in an accident at school, and she was walking around like this, she couldn't find anyone to fix her teeth, totally influencing her life, so her family did not have money to fix her teeth. A complete disaster. Dent d dental care influences you know, social factors and trajectories in an enormous way. But you know, as a public health issue, how do you, you know, you can say that, you can point to studies. How do you make it real for people if you have data about exactly where the problem is and the nature of the problem, you have a better shot at doing that. And uh, that was something we tried to do at the state in Maryland. Now, with thinking that Professor Annis might, might show, I have a very important slide here, which is if you're going to use electronic health data for public health, um, it requires a strong legal and ethical framework. Um, HIPAA does permit the use of identifiable information by public health, but I think there should be some key principles. I won't go into great depth in this, but just to, to acknowledge, it shouldn't all be done in secret. People should know what the public health department is up to. The data should be oriented to really help individuals and communities, and it should be linked to solutions. You're using this data for a reason because you're the public health department and you want to make a difference. So you ask yourself, why shouldn't public health be able to identify buildings linked to asthma attacks right away and use that information to fight for better housing? Design programs that help individuals with addiction regain control over their lives and demonstrate rapidly how this affects overdose, track falls among the elderly, and deploy a range of social and medical interventions to see what works really rapidly, like you would track infections in the ICU, be able to show the effects of income inequity on mortality this week as opposed to two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Are we making progress? Can we show that this is something we can manage to? Number three on here, Baltimore is trying. We have a grant working with the health department to track every fall by a senior in Baltimore that goes to the hospital, map it, and get out there with preventive interventions and see whether it works. Um, the city uh, did a regulation to establish the authority and explain publicly, public comment period, what um, it intends to do to help um, older adults stay independent and live their lives. Second opportunity, engaging with changes in healthcare. So I think there are different ways of thinking about the relationship between public health and healthcare. So um, the question here is maybe a little aggressively posed, is public health locked in a struggle with healthcare? And some people would say yes to that, that look, it is totally unbalanced how much money goes to acute care in the United States, particularly compared to public health and prevention. It's absurd. You know, it's 97%, 98%, 96%, you know, depending on the way you look at the numbers. So much goes to after the fact. So little goes to prevention. Um, people naturally in the public health field say, like, you know, we cannot be just a, you know, handmaid into healthcare. We have to have our own field and really focus on upstream issues and not spend our time, you know, dealing with uh, health care. There's another way to think about it, which is that ultimately both health care and public health have the same goal, that health care does have some important prevention things to do, and that changes, this is really the important one, 
changes in healthcare provide new opportunities for going upstream. So I'm going to give you an example of that. It's a starting point to say that healthcare is too expensive. I was telling some of the faculty earlier today that when I was the Secretary of Health in Maryland, I had an epiphany one day. Nobody is talking about healthcare costs in Maryland because usually it's the business community that worries about healthcare costs, and a lot of the business community in Maryland was hospitals. You know, so they weren't. They, they, that, that, they, they, there wasn't an indigenous industry in quite the same way. And I wrote an op-ed: healthcare costs are a public health problem. You know, I wanted to claim that issue. Why? Because. Um, healthcare way too expensive and crowding out other important investments in social determinants, in um, prevention. Um, there are three, you know, graphs in public health that get darker. You know, with the, the this is the um, not the obesity graph and it's not the overdose graph. It's the healthcare cost graph. It's an old one, but you know, um, uh, this is this this signifies the employer premiums as a percentage of median household income. So um, there is just a huge amount of strain in the private insurance industry because people can't pay for health care anymore. Um, it's not uncommon to have a $5,000 or $10,000 deductible. Uh, it's an enormous challenge. That's the un one of the underlying challenges in the Affordable Care Act implementation is that health care costs are just too expensive for a lot of families and businesses to afford. Then you look at the federal government. How many people have seen that graph? This is the Bipartisan Policy Center. It projects federal expenditures out to like, what is that, 2051. There's one line increasing, and it isn't the Defense Department. It's not Social Security. It's health care. Every budget showdown in Washington is about health care costs indirectly. It's the only expenditure that goes up in the future. And then you look at a state. This was just Maryland. It could be any state. That red line at the top is the relative increase in health care costs. For the state budget, it's just swallowing all other kinds of investment. It's, it's growing far faster than public safety, public education, and, and public housing, pretty much anything else. So that is creating an opportunity for public health. And I think it's an incredibly important opportunity for public health to take care of. And I'll give you an example in Maryland. So we've had a unique situation in Maryland. Um, Maryland is the only state in the country that sets the rates for hospital services. So 49 states and the District of Columbia, the hospitals negotiate the rates with the payers. Medicare sets its rates. In Maryland, there's a commission appointed by the governor that sets what each hospital is allowed to charge. Each hospital essentially gets a rate card. The rate card for one hospital might be different from another, but all payers pay off that rate card, including Medicare. So, Medicare pays Maryland rates in Maryland and Medicare rates in 49 states in the District of Columbia. Over 35 years, that system has been in effect and it had a number of very positive attributes, including that it eliminated cost shifting between payers, it allocated the cost of uncompensated care, so every hospital bill in Maryland has an extra charge of about 7%. All that money goes into a pool and it goes out to pay for uncompensated care. And it allowed for creative use of incentives for quality and other things. But there was a problem. Medicare did not agree to participate in Maryland's system unconditionally. Maryland set, uh, Medicare set two conditions. Medicare did not agree to participate in Maryland's system unconditionally. The two conditions were, first of all, every payer has to pay the same amount. So the system couldn't get together and say, I've got a great idea, you know, one price for everyone and twice the price for Medicare. That was illegal. And Medicare would say, we're done. You're going to, we're going to treat you like every other state. They couldn't get together. If, if, if the rate setting system said, you know, for everyone over 65, we're going to charge you. No, that's, we understand. We see where that's going. That wasn't legal. We can't do that. The second condition is that we had to keep the rate of growth of prices per admission below the rate of growth nationally. Sort of saying, OK, we understand that your prices might be higher, Maryland, but you're going to grow slower over time than the national rate of growth. Okay. And the difference between the national rate of growth and the Maryland rate of growth had a term for it in Maryland, a term of art called the waiver cushion. Now, I'm going to explain why I'm going into this level of detail. There were like 100 people in the state of Maryland who knew what the term waiver cushion meant. But without the waiver cushion being positive, the whole basis of hospital payment in Maryland would go away. They would have all this you know, additional money from Medicare and Medicaid would drop out. There'd be all this cost shifting going on. It would be total chaos. So that waiver cushion, when it was 20%, the 
the hospitals and the system felt pretty flush. There were major capital investments. I would joke with them. They all got new lobbies. They never thought that was funny. You know, then it goes down to 10% and people are like, okay, we're feeling okay. You know, we're not going to lose this system. Then it went down to 7%. Everybody panicked and they did all these emergency things and they got it back up to 10%, 11%. And then I started as Secretary of Health and it, the report was 1.4%. Okay, which got everybody very anxious because the report was a year old. All the reports we get were a year old. And if those lines crossed in Maryland, Maryland would owe the difference under the curve back to the federal government. And basically this created in Maryland more of a crisis, a more focused crisis than exists nationally. It was ahead of the curve in terms of the cost crisis. So we saw the crisis in healthcare costs as a unique opportunity for health. And we had an opportunity to restructure hospital payment. Um, one of the big problems in payment in healthcare in general is that you generally pay more for more services, fee-for-service payment of one form or another. And, you know, I, had a, I worked for Governor, Governor O'Malley, who said, why do we need to keep paying hospitals like hotels? Hospitals shouldn't be thinking about needing to stay busy all the time. That's not good for the health of the community. Can we pay them a different way? And we had a pilot going on in the state, which was called global budgeting which meant a hospital knew how much money it was going to get for patient revenue in advance for the year. No matter how many patients came in, no matter how many MRIs, right? Totally different set of financial incentives. We did this in 10 rural areas. So you talk to one of those CEOs, they go, every week for my entire career in hospitals, we would have a meeting, look at how many beds were filled, and decide what could we do to increase the number of beds being filled. Then we went to a budget. And we had a meeting every week to how we can reduce the number of beds being filled, right? It says, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. What's up is down, what's down is up. What can we do differently? So what did they do differently? They did all kinds of things differently. They, they, they um, set up chronic care clinics on the outpatient side. They, instead of just giving prescriptions, they gave the medicines. Instead of giving phone numbers, they gave appointments. They hired 24-7 case managers in the ER. And they actually closed units and kept the difference. There was a nice article in the New York Times about one of these rural hospitals and we decided to build on that concept to rescue the system in the middle of this cost crisis. Our old model was volume driven even though each hospital had a rate card and all you know there was no cost shifting that was somewhat innovative but 30 years later it's a fee-for-service system still. People are just getting their rates set. We went to a population driven model where basically there's a global budget for that for, for Maryland residents. Um, this was called the boldest proposal in the United States in the last half century to grab the problem of cost growth by the horns by Professor Reinhardt, uh, one of the leading health economists in the country. Our initial results have been uh, pretty good. Um, all the hospitals moved to global budgets very quickly. Uh, we had much lower health care costs. We saved Medicare money. We had major reductions in hospital-acquired conditions and readmissions. And what was really interesting was what was happening outside the hospital. So, uh, for example, uh, hospitals moved to global budgets very quickly. Uh, we had much lower health care costs. We saved Medicare money. Uh, we had major reductions in hospital-acquired conditions and readmissions. I was, like, literally in line for bagels with the fire chief when I was health commissioner, and he said, we have a problem with people who keep calling 911. And I said, you know, well, talk to me about that. And I said, well, there's some people, they just call 911 all the time, and, you know, our ambulances are all tied up. I'm like, well, can you give me the names of them? You know, we'll send somebody out. This was before HIPAA, not really, no, it wasn't before HIPAA, but it was, you know, we were all in the family. I, I, I will not comment on anything related to the, uh, I'm just looking at, Professor Anna's here, but we, you know, we, we, got, we got the list and we sent people out. The number one caller in the city of Baltimore who called essentially every day was like a 93-year-old woman who was perfectly healthy and lonely and she thought the EMTs were cute, okay? They came every day, they checked in on her, they left, okay? We found her a sufficiently cute home visitor. And, you know, the guys were upset back at the station, but, you know, everybody moved on. Number two was a, um, 
Number two was a woman whose husband thought that when you gave insulin, it was a pro you know, you went unconscious and you called 911. Every time he gave her insulin, she went unconscious, he called 911. Now, he was possibly treating her depression. I mean, the old pre-antidepressant treatment for depression was to give insulin until people seized and then give them dextrose until they woke up. So I met old psychiatrists who, in the Navy, their job was to make everyone seize every morning and then give them, you know, with insulin. So he was sort of doing that. I don't know if she was even depressed to start with, but by the end of this experience, she probably, she probably was. They got her on the right dose of insulin. They got a training for the insulin, and that wiped out her use of hospital services. We published a paper that this the intervention was cost-saving in the ER costs alone. And we had a great medical student working with us, and we convened all of the ER doctors. And the ER doctors were in the city, the, the ER chiefs of each of the hospitals. They were so excited. We had this meeting in City Hall. And they, they were like just so, so proud. And the medical student said, this is so great. The hospitals can all contribute to this, and you can scale this program. And it was a absolute emperor has no clothes moment, right? The hospitals in Maryland were making money every time one of those patients went to the ER, right? If you came in from Mars, you'd say, why do we have a healthcare system that, you know, abs it does, it's not even the incentives aren't in the right place. The incentives are totally in the wrong place. That you can have someone who's coming to the ER every single day and the hospital's making money, even if it's entirely preventable. So she shamed us into writing letters. I wrote letters to, I was like, uh, we'll write the hospitals. I didn't know what to say. We wrote every hospital. They all said no. The fire department continued the program. We switched to global budgets, and the hospitals have actually picked up the program, some of them, where they're paying to engage the same program with the patients and kind of uh, actually try to prevent problems. I'll tell you one other story, which is in Western Maryland, um, I got a call because there was a big fight between the school system and the public health department over the school nursing program. And then suddenly I heard that the hospital had stepped in and was going to employ all the school nurses, like 80 staff, 20,000 students. And I called the CEO. I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, we're in a global budget. So we looked at our data, and there's so many kids coming for asthma to the ER. Um, and we thought, we can take over the school health program, run it at cost, focus on asthma, and save all the money. And they did it. They had a huge decline in asthma. And you ask yourself, like, why is it that the rest of the country pays for every time a child has a preventable case of asthma? Now, I know that there are, that is shifting. But that change to actually shift the $4 trillion that goes into healthcare to incentivize health starts to push that money upstream. Um, I think that there's tremendous opportunity. I actually will even argue the other point that as long as the healthcare system is oriented towards volume, as long as that hospital has to stay filled, it is very hard to get the resources and the focus on any kind of prevention, including upstream prevention. You can talk about it, you can talk about community benefit, but if at the end of the day, it's a giant sucking sound for acute care, there's not that incentive for prevention, it's very, very hard to be successful. And I think that public health schools should embrace the challenge of reforming health care and embrace the challenge of health care costs, because I think it's a real opportunity for, for public health. So let me talk about opportunity number three, responding to crises. So the fire department gets to fight fires. The police department gets to drive down the street with sirens on. The health department gets to deal with crises, one kind or another. And um, if you're not successful in dealing with the crisis, nobody says, but they're such a good strategic planner. You know, it does not happen, right? So it, whether you're successful in a job in public health depends on whether you can handle the emergent thing. And then you build up your credibility to be able to maybe do a little strategic planning. Or even better, you use the crisis to achieve something really interesting. And in fact, my course, I go through the history of public health. The FDA didn't just emerge out of nothing. It emerged out of crises, huge crises. And it was only in the wake of crises and the, and the effect of handling of crises that you get more authority, more resources. And if you're going to try to tackle some of these really hard things in public health and go upstream, you have to be prepared to capitalize on the things that bring political valence to it. So um, this is the reality of public health practice. It's not strategic planning. You're dealing with crises from day one. And 
I could go through all manner of crises. We had ostriches running down the inner harbor of Baltimore. I mean, you, you just go, uh, animal control alone would be in a very interesting lecture. Um, I would say that um, it is really important for public health schools and public health graduates to have in mind a game plan for crisis. Just like, you know, I learned how to deal with a patient who didn't have a heartbeat from Dr. Vinci. Um, public health graduates and public health schools should embrace what do you do and be ready for different kinds of crises. Um, what is a crisis? There are three definitions in the Oxford English Dictionary. A time of intense difficulty or danger, a time when a difficult or important decision must be made, the turning point of a, a disease when an important change takes place indicating either recovery or death. And I really like that definition. Okay, that's a pretty cool definition. At a moment of crisis, and you know when you're in it a lot, you have to recognize it, you're either going to succeed and be seen as successful or it is a miserable disaster. And you want to be prepared for that, you want to think about that, and you want to be able to use that. Um, there's a whole literature of crisis that I'm getting comfortable with, sort of. Um, uh, crisis creates a context in which challenges to existing norms and practices may be made. Um, crisis, economic, there's a literature of economic crisis, there's a little, literature of social crisis. If you, we need to change, I mean, what, what Dean Galea and, and Professor Annis are saying in their article, we've got to change the way we think about health, we've got to push upstream, you know, it's in moments of crisis that people have a chance to look at issues differently and to be prepared to take advantage of that. But one of the other themes of the crisis literature is that it's not easy. That um, oftentimes crises end in finger pointing and no forward progress. That people say, okay, okay, it's over. We can go back to business as usual. Um, people can push back against any kind of changes if you don't do it strategically. And there's a concept of first order and second order learning like you know, the first order of learning is, well, they should have done corrosion control in Flint and they wouldn't have had the problem, you know, and that's just, we're done, you know. And the second order of learning is, wait a second, we have a, a whole problem of environmental health and environmental justice and how do we use this as an opportunity to think differently about those issues. So, um, I'll give you four examples very briefly of crises that are in the news almost every day where I think public health really needs to be deeply, deeply engaged. One of them is the epidemic of opioid overdose. And uh, one of your affiliated faculty members, Tracy Green, is working in Rhode Island doing phenomenal work with the governor's office with her sleeves rolled up to really reduce uh, opioid overdoses. Um, if you think about the social determinants of health, they are all over that issue. But you have to be ready to jump in and say, we've got some answers. We can be practical. You know, what are, what are we going to do? You, you have governors finally talking about addiction and the issues that go into addiction. Come up with a strategy. And uh, the strategy that Rhode Island came up with, with working with an academic team, very coherent. We want to increase treatment. We want to increase treatment and detention. We've got to think differently about the criminal justice system. We want to really provide recovery supports, including access to jobs and housing for patients. And they're getting new investments in those areas because they've hitched that appropriately to the engine of opioid overdose. Flint, Michigan is another very good example. Um, and I think while I understand and I'm not disputing the issues of blame that have gone on, it would be a travesty for public health if people thought that this was just solely an issue of incompetent people in certain positions. There are fundamental issues that are arising from Flint and it's public health's job in part to be able to have that conversation and use it to leverage longer term solutions not just in Flint and elsewhere. The issue of drug prices, you read about that in the paper. You know, take uh, hepatitis C drug prices which can be $40,000 a course now, start out at $80,000 a course. Um, well, Less than 10% of the people who have hepatitis C are getting treated at those prices. That is an you know, incredibly important challenge for public health. And why are, why are so few people getting treated? Because a huge number of them are in detention and jails where they can't get treatment. And engaging with drug pricing gives you an opportunity to talk about that public health problem because people care about drug pricing. You, um, you, know, you want to use in public health what's out there appropriately to drive attention and create power for what you're trying to accomplish. Police departments, you know, we, we're, I, I live in a city with a very challenged police department. 
And those challenges are opportunities to get people to think differently about the nature, not just of police community relations, but the nature of the kind of investments that have to be made in communities for them to be healthy. And you can say, well, that's really a police issue, but you're squandering an opportunity if you do that. So um, my implications there are that I, I do think, you know, everyone in the country should take my new course. I'm just kidding. Um, let me just say that I've become uh, sobered by the Twitter generation's ability to provide a devastating review of a professor, so, or the Instagram. So I, I generally get good reviews for my courses, but it's the one, you know, Dr. Sharfstein thinks he's seen it all. You know, it hurts. I just want you to know it hurts. Okay, so, um, but anyway, I'm working on it. I'm revamping my course this year. I'm really gonna, uh, I'm throwing, it's really fun to teach students and to um, both seek, to crave their approval, okay, I'll be honest. But, um, but uh, try to interest them in dealing with crises. And in my class, I have students write about a crisis, what could have been done differently. I give them an assignment to, think about how a crisis could have been better leveraged for an actual better public health outcome. Um, really, really interesting uh, work that they do. And then I also think that the schools of public health should be prepared to jump in, align with the public sector, go after problems, offer support. You know, on, on the police, at, at our school, we have a team working now in the police department, with the police department, trying to use data better, both uh, to improve community relations and reduce gun violence in our city. Um, last opportunity, using regulatory authority deliberately and appropriately. So um, public health is powerful. The Health Department of Baltimore was founded during an epidemic of what? Disease. Anyone? 1798. 1799. Yellow fever. Big yellow fever. The health commissioner has the authority to quarantine the entire city. Okay. The mayor always said to me, you've got all the power. You know, of course, he could fire me. But you know, the, the health codes are incredibly strong in terms of the authority. Now, obviously, um, there's city authority in the city charter. There's state authority that's delegated through the state. Um, as I learned, all city authority is delegated through the state. I don't want to get marked down. Um, the um, uh, federal authority. And public health departments and people in public health should be ready and able to think about using authority formally and informally to save lives, raise the profile of public health, and to drive attention to underlying and broader challenges. So I'll go through a few really brief examples, and then we'll, we'll be done for questions. So lead in children's jewelry. Um, when I was a uh, health commissioner, I read a story about a child who died after eating a little trinket that came off of a Reebok shoe, I think. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure it was a Reebok shoe, but if not, I apologize to Reebok. Um, and it was uh, misread on the x-ray. You know, they thought it was an artifact. It was actually in the stomach, caused uh, lead encephalopathy, and the child died. And I went out and I tested the lead in the city. Uh, we went out, $10, that was like $10 a test, you know, uh, applying some of the skills I learned from Les Bowden's class. And we found it, you know, um, in different stores. And I proposed a ban on lead in children's jewelry. And we then implemented it in Baltimore. We did tests. We, you know, I, I remember, anyone heard of the, the store Claire's? So we found a lethal amount of lead in a Claire's piece of jewelry. And I called with the lawyers and I said, uh, we found this. It was in the princess collection. Let me just say, this is not my lecture on writing, but there was no better headline, in my experience, as lead found in princess collection. It was just, it just it captured it. So we did that headline in the press release. Huge, you were ready to go. I called and I said, listen, before we do this, I'm going to give you the chance to pull this from the shelves and say that you cooperated with us. Or, in the press release, I'm going to say, we're sending the police under an order of the health commissioner to pull it off the shelf. It's your choice. And they said, we'll get back to you Monday. I said, you have an hour. Okay? Just, you know, they, they had dodged my call for three days. And I was not happy at that point. So um, they got back with an hour. They said they're pulling it from the shelves. And then on Monday, they called and they said, we consulted our lawyers. We don't think you had that authority to force us to do that. And I said, 
I don't recall I forced you to do anything. I think you did it voluntarily. I'm trying to recall what actually happened. They were very resistant. Turned out when the federal government got around to testing Claire's jewelry, they had all kinds of problems. They were called before Congress. There's all sorts of issues. And eventually, um, because we, we kept finding lead, we sent our staff to testify before Congress. We got the major law on lead, raising elevate, uh, elevating lead from one city health department with a little bit of authority. We used the same authority from the original health code on nuisances in order to ban lead. Um, when uh, I was the health commissioner, uh, I, I led an effort with the local pediatric department and some pediatricians uh, up here and elsewhere to um, recommend that over-the-counter cough and cold medicines for kids come off the market. Um, and. Uh, make a long story short, we, we recommended it, um, and the FDA uh, had an advisory committee meeting. All the products for age two came off the market before we had the advisory committee meeting, and then the experts agreed with us, and eventually they all came off afterwards. And um, a lot of follow-up research has shown massive declines in the number of ER visits and overdoses that happened um, among young kids. You can't, it's not labeled, and you can't find the little products that you know, we had when I was in the clinic, and it's not labeled for kids. They used to have a lot of babies on the packages. You can't find that anymore. Caffeinated alcoholic beverages. Sometimes you get some undergraduates here. It's a little before your time, but my graduate students, they remember Four loco when it had alcohol and sugar in it, right? One can had um, five beers worth of alcohol, five Diet Pepsi's worth of caffeine. Kids would go to parties. They'd be given two cans, told to drink them both before they could sit down. They were you know, assaults, accidents, poisonings. People, kids were going to the ER. Um, now, what we did, we did in that case is we, in, as we did in these, these other areas, there was public opportunity for public comment. We actually wrote to companies and asked for their evidence on whether caffeine was safe to add to alcohol. They didn't provide compelling information. Um, but we talked about the challenges a little bit more broadly of alcohol on campus when we did this, and um, we were able to take them off the market. And uh, here's another example, maybe a little bit better example, of using regulatory authority deliberately, but thinking about the bigger picture. How many, knows, how many people here know what a baby bumper pad is? It goes inside the crib, right? So the crib is tested every which way by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, just incredible. And then you stuff this huge, unregulated thing inside it, right? And um, when I was the... Uh, the health secretary, there was a, uh, a study that got published uh, that there were like 25 deaths attributed to kids asphyxiating or getting choked. And so we looked into it. We had a public comment period. We convened an advisory committee. And the whole time we talked about the um, broader issue. So when, when I was the health commissioner, I chaired the child fatality review. We had 20 unexplained deaths of infants from sleep, during sleep, 20 to, 20 to 30. Um, a year in, in the city. And uh, I, would, I once did a press release and nobody covered it. You know, safe sleep, so important. On your back, a lone back crib. That's, you know, you want babies to sleep alone on their back in a crib, totally bare of stuffed animals and blankets and bumpers. Couldn't get the message out. When I said that we might ban bumper pads, I got saturation media coverage that we were even thinking about a regulatory action on bumper pads, saturation media coverage. And I didn't just talk about bumper pads. I talked about safe sleep and all the different things that were associated with it. Uh, we did a couple public comment periods. We, posed it, we did the first state that proposed a ban on their sale. Uh, I went to battle with the baby bumper pad injury uh, industry. There is a baby bumper pad industry. Highlight of the hearing that we had in the General Assembly. I, uh, you heard I worked for Congressman Waxman. I worked on the committee that had a lot of hearings, like the baseball hearing and other things. So I was a little bit of a ringer. I, we wrote a question for one of our friendly delegates to ask the baby bumper pad industry, which was, you just heard the medical examiner say that babies, if they get too close, can start doing rebreathing or even asphyxiate. What do you recommend to the baby if they get too close to the bumper pad? <laughs> now, you know, some of these questions, maybe not totally fair. You'd be the judge. And the guy from the industry said, well, in that case, I'd recommend that the baby back away from the bump. 
So we did it. We banned the sale of baby bumper pads. We had a huge push. We used every media opportunity to push on the overall safe sleep messages and the importance. And we've seen a substantial decline of sleep-related deaths. Now, there were many other things going on to accomplish this, but it was very consistent with the public health push that we had. And I'm hearing that there are going to be some very good numbers for 2015 that are about to come out. So I do think that the corner of public health and law is a powerful place. It's very important to do regulation well and appropriately and engage the public and teach them. It's an incredible public education tool. All you need is like the whiff of a possibility of regulation. Uh, you know, I learned about the importance of breastfeeding when I worked at Boston Medical Center. There was a doctor who was my hero on that topic and couldn't get for many years any of the hospitals interested in Maryland in becoming baby friendly. Boston Medical Center, still baby friendly, Bob? Yes, it is. So a uh, baby friendly means no free formula, all these different things to really encourage breastfeeding. Not a single hospital in Maryland. Couldn't get them to do it. I wrote him a letter that said, you know, it's pretty interesting. The state health secretary has the authority to require things that are really important for children's health and, in, and the health of babies. And pretty interesting how important breastfeeding is. Anyway, we were thinking about your plans for baby friendly or what, you know, let's have a conversation about it. Everybody came. The, I said the hospitals have developed a voluntary, voluntary standard and every hospital did it. And a number of them became baby friendly in Maryland. So I think, you know, really unthinking through the, the legal side. So um, finally, I'm running out of time here, I will say that going upstream is a direction, but it's not a game plan. Uh, strategy and execution in public health is about how to get there. There are multiple tools in the public health toolbox. So you have the basis what we want to do, how we're going to accomplish social justice changes, what, the direction we want to go. But you've got to use the, the tools you have in your toolbox to get there. And teaching students about the tools is a really important job. Having them get experience using those tools is an important job. Um, and I've just talked about a few of the tools, but I do think that there are others. Um, public health is incredibly important. It is also incredibly exciting and fun. And I think it's really, you know, whether you're chasing after an ostrich in the inner harbor or you're um, thinking strategically about how to get people to think differently about the association of place with life expectancy and mortality and understand disparities and equity in a different way and in, a, in, a, in an urgent way, those are tactical things. That strategy is part of, of public health, too. And um, it's a really great opportunity for, for people in the field, for students, for faculty to be involved, and for schools to provide leadership. So um, with that, I will conclude with that report that led to the founding of the school in 1915, because it had to define the question of what is public health. And what it said is here in blue, that unity is to be found in the end to be accomplished, the preservation and improvement of health, rather than the means essential to the end. Public health is a supremely flexible field. There's a lot of different tools you bring to the table. And taking advantage of that, working with healthcare, some of the things I've talked about, really makes for a wonderful um, set of opportunities. And I know how challenging accomplishing the vision that we're talking about today is, but I think there's every reason to believe that public health is a set of tools that can make progress. So thank you all. And maybe we have time for a couple questions. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I found your oh. thank you. Um, I found your presentation on the relationship between public health and crisis very enlightening. Uh, now the word crisis has a dual meaning in Greek. It means uh, crisis, and it means judgment as well. So as, you know, judgment day is crisis day. Uh, no, so my question is, um, do you have any piece of advice to us, both faculty and students, of how we should sharpen our judgment to be ready for crisis in the future? I think that's a great question, because a lot of crisis management is about judgment. How much can you get? I worked for five years for Congressman Waxman, who was a real hero on Cap Capitol Hill enormous amount of, of health legislation. And that was a five-year postdoc in judgment for me. You know, when is a good compromise? When is a compromise a good compromise? How do you navigate different things? But I think you get it by jumping in. You know, you figure things out. You, you, you work with people who've had more experience in a particular area. 
But if you, foc if you focus on a problem, if you see a crisis developing, if you imagine that there's a crisis that could happen, or you want to define something as a crisis and you're able to do that in an effective way. If you think about the progress that's been made on tobacco, it has been, or, or the progress that was made on HIV in the 1980s, it was because people came and, and got people to treat things as a crisis and got very different things to happen. I, I think there's a lot to be learned about judgment from history in this. And so I think it's an it's a interesting opportunity. And in your field, I think it's good to learn about how things developed and how things were managed and, and engage with that as a way to think about how to take advantage of opportunities like that in the future. I really like almost everything you had to say, but I'm going to go to the other side a little okay. bit. Because yeah, there's this new concept, that, well, not that new, but called a like public health emergency, mm -hmm. which is similar to your crisis thing, but I think takes it to the next step. And I've always been worried of public health taking too, using those emergencies to take too much power. I know it's weird in a public health audience to think, oh, we're too powerful, rather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think, you know, you pointed out not only are we powerful, but we can be a lot more powerful if we use data and take advantage of crises. So two, one thing mainly, uh, I know they don't like strategic planning necessarily, yeah. but it seems to me you need a strategic plan to decide which crises to take advantage of and how to take advantage of them, and which crises to make worse with data, mm -hmm. which I think you did with the baby bumpers and some of the other things. So, so how do you decide how I, to do that? I definitely, you know, this is, um, I have a, you know, we could talk a lot about overreaching public health agencies. You know, when, when public health commissioners get together, they talk about like these horribly embarrassing things that their agencies, you know, did. My agency uh, banned, uh, nearly banned sunscreen, sunscreen at summer camp. You know, it was not a good thing because there was a committee that got together. People started, you know, thinking about the worst case scenarios, and, and so it's like. We sent on a memo to every camp in the state, you know, if you're going to put sunscreen on a camper, try not to touch them. <laughs> and one camper under no circumstances can put sunscreen on another camper. You know, so we had to retract that pretty quickly. After there was a front page article in the Washington Post where a dermatologist said it was the stupidest policy they'd ever seen in their life. Um, you know, uh, in New York, they they declared wiffle ball a contact sport that required all these. You know, so we you know you get together. So. That, that those are the humorous ones. There are some not so humorous ones. Having an appropriate, you know, approach is um, important. I do think you have to have a sense of purpose and direction, and um, it's a balance though because you don't get to pick the crises thrown your way entirely. When when I was the very first day as health commissioner, um, somebody called me from the media and said, "I'm I'm calling to ask you whether asthma is an epidemic in Baltimore City." It was my first day. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna get back to you. And I convened everybody. I'm like, guys, we got this really important question, you know. And it's like, well, it's, you know, we're higher asthma in Baltimore than other places, but the numbers are going down if you look at, you know, the uh, BRFSS. And so, you know, and so I call back, I'm like, I think it's an important problem, but I wouldn't call it an epidemic. I'm like, really? Because we're in a community here, a third of the kids have asthma, and it's a huge problem, you know, but I guess you're the health commissioner. You know? I'm like, I'm sorry. Did I say, well, I, it is absolutely an epidemic. You know, in that moment, I realized that you know, there's nobody after I die who's going to give me points for you know staying true to the line on the term epidemic. You know, like you know, it's like we've got, it's it's it could be you know, it's you, you got to think about the opportunities you have, and so I think that you're right. I'm not saying power for power's sake. You've got to figure out what you want to be accomplishing to be strategic in each of these areas, but. You really don't know what's going to hit. And, and I've seen public health officials not be successful because they've said, this is my singular focus. If I focus entirely on this one thing, I'm going you know, to get it accomplished. And literally, incredible opportunities are whizzing by that they're not taking advantage of. And so you know, I think it's an appropriate caution. But it's, uh, in practice, you're, you're dealing with these crises. And you've got to do your best to figure out whether there's a, something you can leverage. Andy. Hi, I I um I also liked your uh, your points about using fresh data, and particularly uh, interested in the kinds of data that come 
that can explain or illuminate some of the social determinants of health. But then the question arises whether we should support the kinds of proposals that suggest linking uh, data from medical records and hospitals with social media, um, consumer purchases, Twitter accounts, uh, insurance claims data, and whether that can be done in any way that has uh, attention to privacy, because obviously that's not very so private I, anymore. Right, uh, it's a great question. The way I approach these issues is that kind of goes back to a, a joke. If you know the joke about the um, doctor, the lawyer, and the big data specialist who get abducted by Martians, you know, and the Martian points the ray gun at the lawyer and says, um, maybe I should say it's the public health, I'm, I'm not going to tell a joke. But anyway, all right, so the doctor, the lawyer, the, the big data person, they point the gun at the lawyer, they say, tell me why I shouldn't vaporize you, and the lawyer says, without laws there's no justice, without laws there's anarchy, boom, vaporized, right there. Right? They point the gun at the um, big data specialist, and uh, the doctor jumps in front and says, you know, kill me first. And the Martian says, why? He says, because I don't want the last thing I hear before I die to be yet another explanation of how great big data is. <laughs> you know. So um, the, the, um, my view on this question is you have to start with what you're going to do. Social determinants affect health. There's only so many studies that can be done on that before you start to ask, what are you going to do about it? And I think that you, can, you should be thinking about bringing that data in, but it should always be in orientation to where that's going to lead, more than just opening people's eyes to the relationship. I, I, one reason I did not go into pure research initially was I went to a particular conference where I walked around and I just looked at the titles of the research projects and I said, I think I can predict the answer to this. You know, is poverty associated with worth? I bet it's going to be yes. You know, <laughs> you know. And so you, you go around and and well, what is it that you're going to do? There was one. Th there was actually a um, thing on why are people fishing in the Hudson River? And you read the the thing and it was because. The signs were in English, and the people fishing couldn't read the signs. You know, there was a problem with PCBs or whatever. And I asked the person, well, what are you going to do about it? And they said, oh, it's really exciting. We're writing it up for publication. <laughs> you know? And so you know, to me, it, you, you've got to, the, the, the secret to, to thinking about this urgent data thing is it's not a research project. And you know, it, it's, uh, we're going to use this data for a particular purpose. The public health schools can be involved. There can be studies done of it, but we, it should be organized around, you know, something that can be, can be done. And so maybe you use anonymized data to understand whether there's a relationship with people buying X, Y, or Z. But by the time you really want identifiable data, so you, it's got to be to do something. And you've got to be able to be transparent about what you're doing, and you've got to be showing that you can have an impact for it to be justified. At least that's my kind of sense of the, the ethics. And I think doing some projects, I hope the law can be compatible with that, too. Please join me in thanking Dr. Sharston. Thank you.